If I told you there was an aircraft that created more aces for the fleet air arm in World War II than any other, that scored more kills than any other aircraft in air-to-air -air combat, you'd probably be talking about and saying, well, you must be talking about the Seafire or the, the Hellcat or the Wildcat, something like that. No, it's the Fairy Fulmar. It's the aircraft which everyone loves to ship on. And honestly, there is some reasoning. Uh, to use the words of Eric Winkle Brown, perhaps the full mile lacked the glamour that attached to, to the single seat fighters of the day, innate soundness and competence not being the stuff of headlines to set the public's adrenaline flowing. There is few aircraft which have been known as interim aircraft which have achieved as much as the full mile. You know, I have to say, I, I love reading some of the assessments of it, and I go online and read them, because the amount of things that I read are like, well, it was the Royal Navy in 1939, when it only just started putting in a radar in 1938, did not have fighter direction control down pat and completely organised yet. I'm so surprised! And... Oh, they're using the full mar when they, you know, which is not a good aircraft. Well, the Royal Navy have been ordering a better aircraft. They've been ordering stuff for Doctrine. The, the reality was, they didn't get it. So, the fairy full mar was what they had. It was supposed to be interim until the Firefly came in. That was the planned aircraft as a scout fighter. It was an interim which was pulled in because, well, the Royal Navy was severely worried that its single-seat fighter was going to get shut down. And <laughs> guess what? That does get shut down very quickly and it, into World War II. It, the Royal Navy's single-seat fighter gets shut down. Why? Because it's using Supermarine. And the Air Ministry goes, no, we need them to focus on the Spitfire. They can't do anything for the Navy. The Navy goes, what about the Warriors? Oh, we don't care about that. But they can't do any fighters. They can only do one fighter. Supermarine can only concentrate on the Spitfire. That's how important it is, in our view. And considering the way the Air Ministry had treated single-seat fighters prior to World War II, honestly, you can understand their panic. It's not very good for the Navy. So that then turns the Fairy Fulmar from being the interim scenario of... Uh, the skewer is a very good dive bomber, but surprise, surprise, something which was procured as a dive bomber primary, but under the cover of a fighter to get it through the air ministry, is not a good fighter. <sighs> so shocking, I never saw that one coming. The rock, which was a turreted version of the skewer, based on the seven principles of the Bolton Paul Defiant, that turreted fighters were going to be absolutely better than regular fighters because the maneuverability of their firepower... Um, yeah, that didn't work for the Bolton Paul the Fight. It didn't work for the Rock, which was even worse. And that, that's saying something, because I the Bolton Paul the Fight at least looks cute. The Rock just looks like... Richard of York is imagined in Shakespearean plays, is all I will say. So, there are some real problems going on there. But the Fairy Fulmer is not one. Please note, she was also originally procured, the program she's procured under was going to be a dive bomber. That's what she was procured for. But that was an RA Air Ministry thing. And then the fairy have this sh aircraft, and the Air Ministry are taking no notice of fairy, they don't care about them at all at this point. So fairy are going, well, we can produce something. And the Royal Navy jumps on it. And this is the aircraft which the Royal Navy takes a lot of its pre-war thinking, a lot of its pre-war doctrine, and tests it. And unsurprisingly, as is the reality for most forces in history, about 50% of the Royal Navy's pre-war doctrine proves absolutely terrible and wrong. It was based on false positives of exercises. Um, good example, using fleet carriers for anti-submarine warfare, because you don't have anything else. Yes, aircraft are a viable thing, but a fleet carrier is a bit much to risk in it, and aircraft, and you need enough escorts, and 
submarines can actually maneuver out of your hunt out of the hunting area to go hunt uh, go hunt the the carrier. That costs the Royal Navy HMS Courageous. There is also times where the Royal Navy's officers actually ignore their own doctrine. HMS Glorious is a good example of this. She is not supposed to be travelling on her own. Even peacetime doctrine had it would have given her more even peacetime practice would have given Glorious a light cruiser and half a flotilla of destroyers at least wandering along with her on her route. You look at when they're moving these ships around, that's usually what they have around them. For much of the 1930s, they have a light cruiser, sometimes it's an Arafusa class, sometimes it's a town, sometimes it's a Leander, sometimes it's an E class. They have half a flotilla of destroyers. At the minimum, usually. That's a very different scenario than Glorious finds itself in. And then we look at air defence. Well, the Royal Navy had been preparing an idea around air defence, and there's a whole discussion about whether fleet air, uh, whether a, a, a carrier aircraft were ever going to be as capable as, sea, as land based aircraft. And there's a whole debate about that. Fleet Air Arm really didn't care. And remember, again, the Royal Navy gets control of procurement. Starts at the Inskip Award is made in 1937. Full control procurement is only transferred to the Royal Navy in 1939. Then World War II breaks out and the Air Ministry goes, all oh, we control all air procurement again. If it's done in the UK, it has to be done for us. We're managing all the air, all the, ma all the factories, all the organisations. And that makes sense. I do understand you need someone under that scenario to be the clearinghouse. But again... They prioritise what the Royal Air Force needs, because the Air Ministry, the Royal Air Force, is their service. So that's one of the reasons why the Na Royal Navy is the first to go hunting in America for aircraft. Because if they can't get what they want when they need it from British factories, they're going to have to buy it elsewhere. And, let's be honest, that's not, not the first time the Royal Navy's done that as far as aircraft were concerned. They had form for doing this. So, the Royal Navy enters war. It has some doctrines, some prove successful, some don't. I, I, I have to say, I will re-emphasize re this point now, but there, you'll be seeing it in certain points. Reading through some books, some of the websites about this, when I was deciding to put together the video on the Ferry Fulma, actually really annoyed me. Because they hold the Royal Navy to a standard which you would never hold any other force to. And what I found funny was on one website, I read an article about the Royal Navy, which apparently in 1940 should have had a codified air defense doctrine, which was 100% successful in fighter direction, fighter control, and the exact aircraft they needed. And then the next point is talking about American air defense development in 1941-42, and how this shows how the US Navy's learning from experience. And I was going, well... Hold them to the same standard here. I agree the US Navy's learning from experience. You could argue, actually you could be harsh on them, because you could say they should have been watching what the Royal Navy was getting up to, and their advisors were with the Royal Navy. Well, advisors sort of, they, they had people watching the Royal Navy and doing Toronto and all those sorts of things. But, you can't say, they don't have that as their own practical experience, so you can't hold them to learn the same lessons from practical experience. It's very different watching other people to doing it yourself. And then you have to give that to the Royal Navy as well, who are implementing new technologies at the same time. Because that's the problem. Everyone was planning on war coming in about 1942 onwards, probably 1945. And so everyone thought they had time and were still implementing some of the new technologies which were coming off the development line. So, Fairy Fulmar. It's one of two interim aircraft procured. The other one is the Sea Gladiator, which they literally take RAF Gladiator fighters, which they're, the RAF are retiring, and slap sea on them, pretty much. That's pretty much what they do to create the Sea Gladiator. And that, yeah, that's called the Plucky Biplanes, which defend Malta. The Fairy Fulmar, because it's a long-range, two-seater aircraft, and in many ways because 
it rather comes in and it stays where it is, and I'll explain why it stays where it is, doesn't get that. It doesn't get that. Shameless book plug. Now, thank you everyone who's been already read this. Thank you to everyone who's already bought this, and thank you to everyone who might buy this. Because, let's be honest, I'm an academic. How I get university roles, how I get promoted in university is based on how many publica how well my publications have sold, how well my publications do. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed and find it useful. It's a good... I think it's a good book for showing the development of Destroyers Through the War, and the fact that there is a development. And judging ships in 1939 by ships in 1945 is a false analogy. You are judging something by a lot of experience gained. There has been a lot of technology developed in the 1920s and 30s with, re with reference to World War I. But World War I is a very different war to World War II. And there have been a lot of exercises in World War II in, in the 1920s and 30s, some of which have been right, some of which have been wrong. The most famous example of exercises going not quite correct, let's be honest, the British testing of German guns and designing their 16-inch guns based on their perception of that information. And, again, Nelson Romney, the guns aren't bad. They're just not anywhere as good as they should have been. So, the Fairy Fulmar is a product of specifications. And so, I know this is a lot of text, but I'm going to expand it full screen. I'm going to read it through, and then I'm going to put it back to there and discuss it. So please note, you can skip forward if you don't want to uh, don't want to read it. It will be a, a couple of minutes at least, though. P4-34, light day bomber, together with operational requirement OR-13, set out requirements for a light day bomber capable of tactical support. The aircraft was to be fully stressed for dive recovery with full bomb load, 500 pounds internally stowed. The maximum speed was to be in the order of 300 miles per hour. Ferry and Hawk attended designs to P434. Two prototypes of each design were ordered in November 1934. Quickly, I'm going to mention this, the British aircraft specification files. Whenever I'm reading out specifications, whenever I'm talking about them, they have literally come from here. Okay, so this is where I get them from. This is the closest thing you can find to the encyclopedia of British aircraft specifications, because literally, that is what this book is, all entirely. You can still find copies to buy. It was published by Air Britain Publication, and it's written, it's compiled by K.J. Meekums and E.B. Morgan. It's a very, very cool book, and if you want to follow the development of aircraft, it's a really great place to chart it. And it's also useful because it kind of turns on its head a lot of the ideas of these aircraft just appear in time of war, or these aircraft just appear here. Good example of this is I'm talking about the Fairy Fulmar, which I'm going to get into is a 1938 procurement, interim procurement, which the Royal Navy's doing. Because even before the war, they've realised the skewer and rock are not really up to the task. They don't know when they're going to get a single-seat fighter. It's supposed to be coming in in 1940, but that's for a different role. That's not long-range escort fighter. That's not an escort role, escort role aircraft. And so that's some of the reality you have to deal with. You know, you, the, the Royal Navy are already doing this before war begins. I know the mantra is these aircraft suddenly appear for war. The reality is different. It really is. 0838. Requirements. In response to Operation Requirement OR56, an interim two-seater front gunfighter is required for quick production for the fleet air arm, capable of operating from catapult ships and from the deck of a carrier. The first aircraft are required for delivery in September 1939. And in order to facilitate design and production, certain concessions on normal requirements for fleet air arm aircraft have been made. It is to be designed as a fighter with a wheel on the carriage, but must be capable of conversion into floats when a reduced performance can be accepted. The all-up weight is not exceeded, is not exceeded 8,750 pounds as a ship plane. As a float plane, the aircraft will not normally operate at an all-up weight exceeding 9,000 pounds. As a ship plane and as a float plane, it is to be designed and equipped for resting, accelerating and catapulting. It is to be capable of folding quickly while on the deck of a carrier or on a catapult in wind speeds of up to 30 knots and is to be capable of being hoisted when folded. The following dimensions shall not be exceeded. Height, 14 foot 9 inches. Length, 40 foot or 44 foot as a float plane. Span, 46 foot spread, 18 foot folded. It is required for air fighting, mainly in the vicinity of the fleet and shallow dive bombing. 
Performance. The maximum speed is to uh, be not less than 230 knots for an operational height of 10,000 foot. The highest maneuverability at the speed is required. The stalling speed is to not exceed 56 knots, with the engine off at full load. Takeoff is to be possible in distance of 225 foot against 20 knot wind speed. The aircraft is to be capable of operating for 6 hours at operational height not less than 120 knots, plus 15 minutes of maximum power at sea level, or at least 2.75 hours at maximum economical cruising speed at 10,000 foot, at plus 15 minutes at maximum power at sea level. The aircraft shall be fully equipped for night flying. The instrument board is to be arranged to be tailored to take the standard flying instrument panel and with operation of, by an engine-driven suction pump. If the undercarriage is made to retract, precautions shall be taken to ensure that there is no change in the compass deviation with the undercarriage in the up or down position. Engine. A Merlin H moderately supercharged engine is to be fitted. The Gravina or other approved type of extinguisher shall also be fitted. Crew. Pilot and observer. Armament. Browning guns, that's .303s, with 4,000 rounds of ammunition. Signals. TR9, R1110. Radios. Based on the P34, uh, P434 design, the first production Fulmar N1854 made its initial flight on the 4th of January 1940, and along with N1855 and N1858, went to A and AE and to Atrus Illustrious for trials. The aircraft was later converted to a Mark II, powered by Merlin 30. In all, some 250 former ones were built, but none as float planes. For those who don't know, the A and AEE is the stands for Airplane and Armament Experimental Establishment, which was, well, it had been established in 1918 and basically stood at Mardelsman Heath, Suffolk, but in 1939 it moved to Boscombe Down in Wiltshire and still goes today as part of the Quinta Q company. So what are we looking at? Well, for starters, this is an aircraft which is supposed to be full service for the Royal Navy. Yes, it's going to have a carry role, but it's also supposed to have a cruiser role and perhaps even a capital ship role as a reconnaissance aircraft. It's a long-range fighter for escorting strikes, but also for reconnaissance. All Royal Navy aircraft are, to an extent, procured with reconnaissance in mind because for the Royal Navy the biggest most important part of the aviation battle is always reconnaissance it's always finding the enemy first and then being able to track them and time your attacks on them remember the Royal Navy likes to do night strikes so having accurate information about where your enemy is really matters which means you need every aircraft like in the US, US Marine Corps, you say every Marine is a rifleman. The Royal Navy needed every aircraft to be a reconnaissance aircraft. They needed to get that sweet, sweet information. That was what they wanted. Now, also, please note, there's a term there which some of you might not be familiar with. It says acceleration. As well as they have to be able to be accelerated, catapulted, and also arrested. Now, the Royal Navy differentiated between the systems which operated from carriers and the systems which operated from ships. They required different methodologies of holding onto the aircraft. So they didn't pretend that they were the same thing. If you were normal, if you were being fired from a ship, you were being catapulted. If you were being fired from an aircraft carrier, you were being accelerated. It was different hard points, it was different ways of configuring the aircraft, it's different for the aircraft. So whilst it might do the same job, it might even use a similar mechanism, some of them did, some of them did, used actually slightly different mechanisms, it's a different thing. So the Royal Navy, to differentiate, calls one accelerate, uh, acceleration, one ca catapulting. And arresting is when you've got the wires across the deck and they come in, land, hook connects, and they go, Ah, I can't go anywhere forever. But pretty much everything is designed to make its operation from a carrier as smooth as possible. A stall speed of 56 knots, that's sweet. That's great for a carrier. That allows a carrier to, if it's going full speed into the wind, the stall speed for the aircraft, it can pretty much glide in. It doesn't matter if its engine's not working, it can glide in over that deck and stay airborne and touch down. It's great for recovery of the aircraft which are damaged. If we get into all of this, all of this, it's about the Royal Navy getting an aircraft which is, most importantly, interim. It is an interim procurement. It is called a, in response to operational requirements, an interim. So it's operational requirements, i.e. the aircraft we've got are not all the aircraft we wanted, 
And the ones we have got can't do the air defense roll. We should probably prioritize the fighter over the dive bomber. But the Royal Navy have been arguing for a dive bomber for so long, they frankly, they were prioritizing the dive bomber because they finally got to be able to prioritize that. This is one of the first requirements which goes through when the Royal Navy has sort of control. Because I said, between 1937 and 1939, there's a transition of control. The award is made by Thomas Inskip's report in 1937. Fleet Air Arms should no longer be part of the Royal Air Force. Should no, it should be allowed to be part of the Royal Navy. The reasoning for that, before anyone starts to get into conspiracy theories, all the various arguments which go around it of, you know, the Air Force being nasty or the Navy being politically grasping, all these things. No, it's literally because some Air Force senior officer had decided to tell Sir Thomas Inskip what his plans were for a war in the Far East, which were to take all the aircraft off the Royal Navy carriers, because he could order them off, he felt, because they were fleet air and owned by the Royal Air Force, load the aircraft carriers up with his aircraft, Take his have the carriers take his aircraft out to the Far East, and then they could come back for their own aircraft, which would mean the Royal Navy would be left without carrier aircraft or carriers for about four or five months in the in, in the beginning of a war in the Far East. Especially when you consider quite a lot of those carriers would have to have the aircraft craned aboard because the aircraft weren't designed to land on carriers in the first place. Um. This was not really a widespread idea. It really wasn't. But there were enough people with this view, and enough people putting forward that as an idea, that Inskip decided that, frankly, the Air Ministry should not have anything to do with aircraft carriers. He also does look at the command structures, etc., and goes, well, the Air Ministry is very focused on bomber aircraft at this point, and they are ignoring single-seat aircraft. And he also makes critiques, by the way, in his report of things like fighter command not being given enough attention by the Air Ministry, and coastal command not being given enough attention by the Air Ministry. Basically, what he does is he critiques them, and it's almost a case of, I would take other things off you if I thought I could. But the fleet air arm can go to the Navy. And we can end this dual command structure, which is just causing a nightmare and causing endless political battles. And the dual structure was, of course, to do with pilots, not observers. Which is another interesting thing which sometimes people draw the wrong thing from. Uh, why does this aircraft, why is this aircraft have an observer? Why does the Royal Navy like to have two-seat aircraft? Well, A, they like to have observers in the aircraft for... The reasons of observers are good, an extra pair of eyes for reconnaissance and spotting and seeing what's going on, and they're trained. They're also highly trained navigators, and if you don't have GPS and you're going doing long-range operations, which the Royal Navy likes to do at sea, they like to have aircraft operating far away. That's why they develop beacons and all sorts of things to help guide rare aircraft back. It's better to have as someone who's there to do navigation so that the pilot can concentrate on flying the aircraft. There's also the other reason. The Royal Navy, and as I've discussed this when I just did the whole video about British naval aviation's development in the 1920s and 30s, the Royal Navy had basically developed their observers by selecting their very best. They were being very, very selective of those officers who wanted to fly. And basically using them as the entire Royal Navy pyramid within the fleet air arm command structure because it was an entire officer pyramid of made up of naval officers. The air engineering officers were Royal Air Force. Remember, they weren't Royal Navy in the, when the fleet air arm was part of the Royal Air Force. The pilots, even if they were Royal Navy, they were flying according to their Royal Air Force rank. And you did have some really strange experiences turn up, including at points where lieutenants outranked lieutenant commanders in the air. That could have caused a massive amount of friction. It didn't because they were utterly professional and they were very good at their jobs. But this caused trouble and issues with the Royal Navy because the RAF ranks might not accord with the naval ranks. And it might mean that the Royal Navy wants to see this person go on to senior command positions. But in a squadron, he is only a flight lieutenant or a flying officer, so he cannot get command experience. So the Royal Navy has to withdraw him from the fleet air arm to go give him command experience. Well, then is he want, going to want to come back? What's his? He's going to muck up his career. It, it caused the Royal Navy all sorts of trouble. Observers, being entirely under naval control, entirely under naval promotion, had been going through and going up providing this sort of naval command structure of Na Royal Navy being able to promote people because they were good with air power. 
And so the Royal Navy's doctrine in aviation develops more from its observer corps than its pilots, which does take a very different perspective on aircraft. Because if you consider it pilots, you have to love them, but they often do romanticize their aircraft. Their aircraft and they are one sort of thing. This is, this is them, this is them thrilling, this is their conquering gravity. The observer's the person sitting in the back seat who's thinking about the mission, thinking about the duties. So you have a very different approach. To, again, this course is fun sometimes when people are comparing the doctrines. Uh, the observer's approach to doctrine is very different than a pilot's approach to doctrine. Observer is, how best can we use the aircraft? The pilot is, how best can I use the aircraft? Because often it's them imagining themselves flying it. It's very difficult Sometimes, especially for the very best pilots to disassociate themselves from being the ones flying the aircraft when they're thinking of doctrine. And I love having this discussion with them sometimes and they're, they're putting these ideas. And it's a, uh, the recent Top Gun Maverick is a good example of this, that mo uh, the movie. The fact is Tom Cruise's character is behaving exactly like you would expect someone who is that good a pilot to do. He is not really able to effectively communicate with higher-ups and understand things and put things in their language they understand and they can accept because what they want to use is use aircraft as an asset. Whereas for him, the aircraft is him. It's an extension of him. And that's the difference. So, we have our aircraft. It is a very much desire at being procured as an interim. And there is something I'm going to add here at this point. Because it's being designed and procured as an interim. Pretty much immediately. Fairy discussed the concept of keeping a team watching over it to tinker with it and upgrade it. But... The Air Ministry says, oh, no, no, you can't do that. You have to concentrate on, the, uh, on these other programs. And that includes, of course, the Fairy Firefly. But it means that the small team which had been going to assign to provide upgrades may be produced the idea for a Mark III or a Mark IV. Go away. So the Mark I is the initial aircraft. The Mark II is what it's upgraded to eventually. But the difference between the Mark I and Mark II is really not that great. I would... I would love it to be more than it is, but pretty much what happens is the Mark II, they get a 1,300 horsepower engine to replace their 1,035 horsepower engine. They get a new propeller, which was being assigned, assigned a new engine, some tropical equipment, and they some of them have their .303 Browning machine guns replaced with, well, .5 Browning machine guns. Four. Replacing eight in this case. Um, but some sources there again differ on that in that officially they're supposed to have a 770 rounds per gun. However, it seems like the fitters in the Royal Navy uh, managed to work out a way to at least some of the aircraft to operate with possibly 300, maybe as many as 370 rounds per gun, uh, per gun for the 50 cals. Um, quite a few were finished as night fighters in terms of the Mark IIs with radar. And there were 250 Mark Ones built and 350 Mark IIs built. Um, the night fighting variation which had the AI Mark IV radar or the AI Mark X radar. Um... About a hundred aircraft were converted to that standard. The night fighter interception units mainly weren't carrier based. And why do I say that? Because the Royal Navy still carried throughout the war trying to train all its pilots through night operations and night fighter training and night fighter operations. So they could all be used for it. But the Royal Navy found they needed to protect their own bases from night attacks by enemy bombers and support the Royal Air Force in the defense of the UK. So, yeah, 
an example of 746 Naval Air Squadron, which was a night fighter unit, which was armed with full Mars. Well, they did well, but they spent most of their time operating from Leon Solent. Which, if you're not sure where that is, not far from Southampton and Portsmouth and all the area that the Royal Navy really quite cares about around the Isle of Wight. So yeah, the Royal Navy provides a night fighter unit to help defend it. They also do deploy flights from that squadron on Sim HMS Simar, the uh, Sim Simitar, the ruler class escort carrier, HMS Ravenger, HMS Premier, and HMS Searcher uh, escort carriers occasionally to provide them with their fighters. Uh, it was interesting in that they would sometimes take they would kind <clears throat> of they would often take the Firefly with them when they were deployed. So they would leave the Fulmar back in the Solent, and they would take the Firefly aircraft with them on their deployments. They had night flight and night fighting versions of the Firefly as well. But they did finally stop operating Fulmars in about 1943, um, long after they'd started operating Fireflies, late 1943, early 1944. But yeah, let's get on with the service of the Fulmar. And as I put here, it's not what was dreamed of, but what the Royal Navy's Knights of the Sky rode into battle all the same. Now let's start off with some of the assumptions which go into this aircraft coming to, into existence. For starters, most navies and most nations, even when radars starting to come in, worried about the concept of having to launch fighters, i.e. having fighters on deck, launching them, and then being able to climb up to intercept aircraft. They didn't think they'd be able to do that in time. They didn't think they'd be able to take them far enough away to be able to do them to launch those aircraft for them to get to an interception altitude to be able to intercept aircraft coming in. So, whereas for a land-based fighter, your climb rate is going to be really important. For a sea-based fighter, when you're talking about it, it's endurance which is going to matter because it's going to be loitering up there. And that's how you maintain it. You maintain a combat air patrol. This is understood before, well, <laughs> from before 1938, it's been understood. And this is what affects some of the aircraft procurement. There is also a con perception, especially amongst the politicians at the time. But it had been about among some of the professionals, especially from the air ministry in the 1920s and 30s, that land-based aircraft would always be, have superior performance to sea-based aircraft. That carrier-based aircraft were inherently less viable than, uh, than land-based ones. And it's usually based on the idea of they're going to be heavier. They have to be built to withstand the damage of landing. They have to be built to withstand the rigors of operations at sea. They have to have all sorts of equipment aboard them for survival in sea. And that is to an extent true. But as engines grow more powerful, especially once you get above, above 2,000 horsepower, you actually find that the things start to even out quite quickly that the power to weight to ratio starts to adjust, that the additional weights you have for a sea-based aircraft, a sea, a sea -based aircraft are actually not that different to some of the weights you're now including in land-based aircraft because you're expecting them to do longer range operations. Uh, again, one of the interesting scenarios is the moment you start taking up those aircraft, you start going, well, now we want you to operate at similar distances and we want you to maybe be able to cross the North Sea and we want you to do this and that and all the other long-range operations, uh, suddenly they watched the weight of land-based aircraft go up until they were quite similar to the sea-based aircraft. And with the more power, the power-to-weight ratios got better for the sea-based aircraft until they're pretty much much of a muchness. They're pretty much the same. Now, one of the other interesting things to think about in 1940 when this enters service, and it does enter service in 1940, the USN's frontline fighter was the F-3F, which was interesting. The F-4F had been judged unsuitable for combat due to its lack of pilot armour and self-sealing fuel tanks, both of which, of course, the Fulmar actually has. It had them as part of the initial crew requirement for the P-434, 
because that was part of the requirement for that dive bomber. Uh, now, the A5M, as I've talked about before, is being phased out for the A6M at this point. But the A6M is a fair weather fighter. It's not a night fighter. It's not really what you want to do all weather operations in. And the A6M outperforms pretty much everything at this point. But again, it doesn't have that survivability. So in terms of naval fighter comparisons in 1940, the Fulmar's not bad. It's not going to set your heart racing. It doesn't look like a mean, light, nimble fighter. It doesn't suggest it's a knight flying, you know. It's, it's not this sort of solo one warrior valiantly against the hordes of the enemy charging through the breach. No. No, no. Um, it's a fighter which is designed to be kept keep a constant cap in the air you when you're launching your cap uh, when you're launching your alert fighters they're not being launched to intercept the aircraft they're being launched to replace the cap up at altitude so when you, you see and discuss on sort of books and accounts they go we then we were launching fighters well the cap is actually doing the intercept the aircraft you're launching from the flight deck they are going up to replace the cap they might be diverted to reinforce the cap if a dogfighter, if the enemy, there are more waves coming in. In which case, another pair of set of fighters will be launched to replace the cap in position. And that's why you need 18 aircraft. That's why you need the numbers of aircraft you do to be able to maintain that flow of aircraft. Because if you want to keep, let's say you're keeping four airborne at one time, you have four on deck alert. You then bring four, uh, when you're launching those four, you're bringing four up to the deck. You then, okay, we need to send those four as well. Okay, fine, then we're launching the four on the deck. So that's 12 aircraft you have in the air. And you have six more, and you have to start them being maintained. And, okay, you want to help bring up four more onto the deck. And, oh, now you're down to two aircraft spare airframes. So the moment those aircraft come back, the surviving aircraft, and hopefully you haven't lost any, let's say from the actual intercept operations, and most of the times, because of the speed of the operation, because the enemy come through, attack, and run away. So basically, because of how the operations are supposed to do it, go with naval air defense at sea. What fighters are purpose, or, or the fighters' purpose, is to zoom and boom. They are to break up the enemy airstrikes. So yes, if they kill enemy aircraft, great. And this is why it's quite so amazing some do get to the A status. It's great. But their purpose is not really to sit there and dogfight. Their purpose is to break up enemy strike groups, enemy fighter groups, uh, draw off the enemy fighters, draw off the enemy break up the bombers break up the squad uh, break up the wings into flights and manageable sizes then the heavy aa breaks them up further into single air maximum pairs of aircraft attacking and preferably you're dealing the ships are dealing with single aircraft coming in attack so you've got the fighters breaking up the wings into flights and then the flights being broken up by the heavy aa and the heavy air, then the sort of the medium and the light air engaging the aircraft when they come in. Because if a ship is just dealing with one attacking aircraft, they can concentrate a lot of firepower on it and they can dodge it most of the time in this time period. That's what they can do. It's when you've got multiple aircraft coming in, you can overload a, ca a ship's capacity to defend itself. That is the scenario you are trying to avoid. So fighters, in terms of naval terms, are supposed to break up the strikes. The other thing I'd like to point out is, and this is a small point of di difference between me and Jamie Seedell of Armored Carriers, who has an absolutely exceptional article on his website about the Fulmar, and I have got a link to it below. He would tell you that the interim aircraft is supposed to replace in 1942. It's not. It's supposed to be being phased out in 1941, and that furthest go to 1942. Again, there is always a realisation with aircraft in this time period, you could be phasing out aircraft for a year. That's historically actually what happens. It's phased out over 1943 for a year as a night fighter, as I discussed earlier. And there were, it was starting to be replaced by mainly the Wildcat, or Martlet, as it was originally called in Royal Navy Service, in 1942 onwards. But the thing is, it had supposed to be being fair. It had only been supposed to be uh, providing the Royal Navy with this coverage, this capability, in conjunction with a single seat fighter, which was also under development at the time, for two years. 1940 to 1940, through to, uh, through, uh, from the beginning of 1940 to through the end of 1941. And it's ordered, as again, if we go back to the specification, in 1938. Early in 1938, it's number eight 
of the specifications issued in 1938. Number eight of the specifications issued. So it is only supposed to be an interim aircraft in a period when everyone was hoping there wouldn't be war for at least another four, five years. So if everything had gone to plan, this aircraft would have been a footnote in Royal Navy history. It would have still been a respectable footnote because of its value in developing tactics and doctrine, which would have probably taken place in exercises and other scenarios in a peacetime setting. But in a wartime setting, it's useful. It is useful. Again, this is something which I, I started off by talking about how many aces are made flying the full mark. That is a reality for the Royal Navy. People like Sir Stanley Orr, who'd actually started World War II flying the Blackburn Rock and Blackburn Skewer as part of 806 Naval Air Squadron from Hatson in the Orkney Islands. He then transfers on to when the squadron changes over to Full Mars, and eventually he joins HMS Illustrious in June 1940. He'd taken part in the providing air cover for Operation Dynamo during, in the interim time. And he goes on to get 17 air-to-air -air kills. He claims 7 out of 30 aircraft shot down during the period that Illustrious was in the Mediterranean. 7 of the 30 aircraft. He became an ace flying the full mark. Now, yes, I will say, they are not exactly having to deal with maybe the best enemy fighters as well. There is a fact that the Italians have too few of their best fighter aircraft, and there aren't really German fighter aircraft at that point, but there are plenty of bombers and there are plenty of targets, and that's their job. When the fighters do turn up, they're still intercepting them. But the fact is... The Fulmar's role is always more than just being a fighter. It's not there just to fight. It's there to find the enemy if they're enemy ships. It's there to spot enemy fleet movements if they're moving, or enemy submarine movements. And it's also there to act as a fighter. And it's a fighter which has a very different role than the interceptors which are in the UK. If you judge it next to a Spitfire or a Hurricane, which are these interceptors which are designed to be given alert in enough time because they're on a land base and they've got the chain home with all of its many radars and central command positions that can provide the information, give them the orders, and then they can zoom off, get to altitude, intercept, and come back. That's a very different aircraft profile and a very different set of capabilities you need than you need for a naval cat interceptor, i.e. a combat air patrol interceptor, something which is going to be sitting up in the air waiting for the enemy to come. Now when Illustrious was damaged, or and the rest of the remaining of 806 Squadron and their full Mars went to RAF how far on Malta, and they actually took part actively in the defence of Malta. She did as they did as well as they could, and then when Malta couldn't be, <clears throat> when Malta couldn't repair Illustrious, and she had to be sent to the United States to be fixed, well, 806 Naval Air Squadron and their aircraft transfer across to HMS Formidable, and they provide cover again, using their full Mars from HMS Formidable, and Orr carries on shooting down aircraft. I said he gets to 17. He's the highest scoring Royal Navy ace in World War II. And he gets a lot of his aircraft, a lot of his, his kills, using the Fulmar. So let's consider the actual vitals of the aircraft. Let's consider what we've been talking about, because I've been trying a lot to basically reshape some of the image most people will come to this video with in their mind about a full mar because the image is always comparing the full mar to those wonderful interceptors, those gorgeous aircraft, and going, it's not like them. Well, it's not. But it's not supposed to be like them because it's not doing the same job as them. 
And the Royal Navy did want its own interceptor. They were planning on it. And that's honestly, if history had worked out as the Royal Navy had planned it, carriers like Ark Royal, which again, if you go to the British Naval Aviation Doctrine and Development video, which I put on this channel, and I'll put a link to up here, I think, probably on the screen, a little card will appear if you haven't seen it yet, to explain quickly what I'm going to get into. These aircraft would have been on the strike carriers, the air carriers which were going to carry the larger air group, but also stay further back. And the single seat fighters would have been the aircraft aboard things like the illustrious class, the fleet carriers. The ones which were supposed to be closer to the fleet, closer to the action, and more likely to get attacked. There is a reality behind their doctrine. There is a thought process, a, thi a thinking going on behind it all. And again, this was the interim aircraft. And really, as the interim aircraft, it does also need to be compared against the aircraft. It was repl It was into cover, the Blackburn Skewer. Now, I'm going to do a video about that in the future for the key, uh, for key aircraft series. And while I'm talking about the key aircraft series in the future, I'd really love an, an idea how you think it's going, if you're enjoying it, if you like the fact that I'm carrying on basically a similar approach as I did in the key ship series. And any suggestions for aircraft or ships you would really like to be covered in both series, please do put below below. If they continue to be happy to make people happy and interested in naval history, I'll be doing key leaders next year. Now, which will of course be people. It's worthwhile noting, before we get into this, we should consider that whilst Stanior is the highest scoring ace of the fleet air arm in World War II, the first ace of the Royal Navy in World War II was, um, and I'm going to get it right, Bill Lucy. I always want to call him Lucy Bill for some reason. Anyway, he got his first five kills flying a skewer over Norway. That's what he got his kills in. So what is the point I'm making by ringing it up and by mentioning that? Well, you can have on stats, you can go, well, this aircraft is going to outperform this other aircraft every single time. And you could be right on paper. But if you've got the right tactics, you have the right control, and you have a good uh, skilled pilot, and, let's be honest, a little bit of luck on your side, things can change. And it's more often not how you use things than what you have on paper. What you have on paper, if used right, will win against what the other guy has if they have less, and they still use it right. But if you have more on paper, but you use it wrong, then the other side has a chance. That's when quality can certainly trump quantity. And that might not be quality of individual systems, but quality of use of those systems. So with that in mind, let's consider the vitals of the Fulmar. Crew, too, as I've already mentioned. And this is the picture of the Fulmar you can find in the Fleet Aero Museum in Yeovilton. It's a very nice museum to go and look around, and it's a very nice aircraft to go and look at. Length, 40 foot, 2 inches. Wingspan, 46 foot, 4 and a quarter inches. Height, 14 foot. Wing area, 342 square foot. Airfoil route, uh, NACA 2418, tip NACA 2409. So that's the shaping and profile of the wing. If you go and look those up, you will see there is a specific wing shaping uh, to do with those designations. Empty weight, 7,015 pounds. A solidly built aircraft. Gross weight, 9,672 pounds. Maximum takeoff weight, 10,200 pounds. Power plant, single Rolls-Royce Merlin 30. V12 liquid cooled engine, piston engine, 1,300 horsepower. And by the way, I should point out these are the stats from a Fulmar Mark II which is the most basic upgrade ever seen. It's basically, this is what we're doing to other aircraft which have this engine fit. We'll just do it to the full mar and hope it works. Propellers, three-bladed rotor, constant speed propeller. Maximum speed, 272 miles per hour at 7,250 feet, or that could also be 236 knots. Cruising speed, 235 miles per hour, or 204 knots. Range, 780 miles, or 1,260 kilometers, or 680 nautical miles, depending on how you prefer it. Service ceiling, 27,200 feet. Rate of climb, 1,200 feet a minute. Wing loading, 28 pounds per square foot. 
armament. Normally, and this is normally for both the Mark 1 and the Mark 2's, 8.303 inch at 7.7mm Browning machine guns. But some, some had the 4.5 inch. And occasionally they would carry another .303 Vickers K machine gun in the rear cabin, which theoretically the observer was supposed to pull out and start firing, but often they basically didn't. They concentrated on their job. And 200 pound or 250 pound bombs. Yes, they'd removed their dive bombing facility, but they were still fitted quite often to carry rockets, and there were lots of ad hoc fittings of them in the field. This is why, for example, at the Battle of Taranto, one of the things the Royal Navy would normally do is would normally have deployed a Fulmar, and according to doctrine, as the flare dropping aircraft. So instead of using a swordfish for the flare dropping at night in the night strike operation, you would have used them to carry more torpedoes. Now, they didn't do that because they had so few full miles, and they only had one carrier, that they were straining to maintain the air defense combat air patrol, and they didn't want to risk any full miles on the night operation. So instead, they just sent the swordfish. But that's another really interesting thing when you think about if T Toronto had gone as planned and had been a multi-carrier operation, and Eagle had been there as well as Illustrious, the odds are some full miles would have gone along with the strike. You'd have had sea gladiators aboard Eagle as extra air defense fighters uh, for day operations. You'd have kept most of the full miles probably back, but probably six of the full miles would have gone with as the flare droppers. So you would probably have had a strike of about 36 swordfish and six full miles. And the 36 swordfish, instead of subtracting any for flare droppers, they would have all been either carrying bombs or torpedoes. Probably a two-to-one ratio, as they pretty much went with as they did normally. So you probably talk about 24 torpedo bombers and 12 armed with bombs, and then you'd have the six flare dropping full mass. That makes sense. That would have worked. But again, the realities of the situation force a change. You can have a wonderful doctrine, but the doctrine usually calls for adaption in the face of circumstance. Respect of context, because if you blindly follow doctrine, regardless of the situation, and don't take allowances for the situation, you can end up coming a cropper. It's not the same as not having a doctrine. It's to say it's the situation of having enough confidence in your doctrine and your personnel, you can adapt to the circumstance. And hopefully you make the right call. And let's be honest, Taranto probably was the right call. I would have loved to have seen the full miles there as flare droppers. It would certainly have change some of the opinions put forward by people about them, because it would have seen them in that role, and therefore they'd be linked to Taranto, like the Swordfish are, which might have meant people are less likely to spend their time going, oh, they're not the same as the Spitfire, so they're terrible, when they're just for different roles. I know they can look similar because they're both fighters, but they're different forms of fighter. But the reality is, they needed to have the full mass. They need that the full mass were the safety of the fleet, because breaking up those strikes as far out as they could of enemy aircraft coming in is what provides you with the security. And it's as spares go down, especially with the effect of the Battle of Britain. And this is the full mass really biggest problem. It uses a Merlin engine, which is a gorgeous engine which gives you a lot of power, and it's really good engine. Yes, I agree, but. Because the RAF really, really needs it for the Battle of Britain and really, really need all the spares they can get to maintain maximum capability in the Battle of Britain, that means getting spares out for Alexandria, for the fleet air arms, few full miles operating out there, is a nightmare. It's the same as it is a nightmare to get those things for the Desert Air Force. All those organisations suffer during the Battle of Britain because the priority which justifiably needs to be given to the air defence, uh, to the fighters back in the UK. It's something which you might not think about before war when you're going into war, but it really was a problem for the full mass. And it's another thing which introduced a level of, oh, people going, well, they weren't reliable. Well, they were reliable, but the trouble is their parts, when they wore out, they didn't have enough spare parts to replace them. They didn't couldn't maintain them to the standard which they wanted to maintain them, and they would normally would do. Saying that, though, 
I would argue their service as understated as to use to use that quote again from Winkle Brown sound and competent as it was doesn't make headlines it's the classic scenario every time they let something pass they get screamed and shouted at you know it's ice hockey scenario where if you've ever seen it when the goalie blocks something pretty much no one notices because that's what the goalie's supposed to do they've got the pads they get in the way when the puck gets past the goalie lights flash everyone goes wild so it's very easy for people to forget how many shutouts how many times they work they remember how many pucks get past the goalie not how many times they stop and it's the same with it's the same with any sort of fighter any aircraft which is involved in air defense people don't remember the quiet competence they don't remember the the ones you stop they remember the ones to get through especially when you don't have the added advantage of looking as sexy and gorgeous as a Spitfire does. And I will admit it, they do look gorgeous. I love seeing them fly. They have those wing shapes. They have that emotion. They have the Merlin roar. All these things are wonderful things to hear. It's a great aircraft in so many ways. But that doesn't make this a terrible aircraft. And that is the problem in so many of the... Uh, accounts and articles and descriptions I've read they are comparing this aircraft with an aircraft which it is not and it was never designed to be and was never purposed for and are going because it doesn't have these statistics or comparable statistics to this it is not a good aircraft and that is wrong that is not how you need to judge it that is not how you need to learn from history. That is like looking at the history of apples and saying, well, they're not as orange as oranges, so they haven't done very well. They're both fruit. But there's a difference there, and you don't compare the two because they are different. It's the same with comparing an interceptor to a cap fighter, a cap interceptor. There is a difference. And a good place to start off learning about the service and learning about these things is, um, well, this one. Raw Navy Aces of World War II by Andrew Thomas. It's part of the Osprey Aircraft of the Aces uh, editions. And I've also got here my Imperial Japanese Navy Aces of World War II. And um, that's a good place to start learning about it. Because if when you learn about the Japanese Navy and their approach to the dealing with the full mar, the fact is, they did have some success versus them, but again, this was an aircraft which was supposed to not be in service till in 1941, facing the best of the Japanese Navy. In, well, it's 1942. Yeah, it was supposed to be out of service by the end of 1941. It's in 1942, and it's facing the best of the Japanese Navy. The fact that they score some kills, frankly, to me, is a testimony to the quality of the aircraft. And then we look at the rest of their service, and their service is wide and loud. It's the Mediterranean theatre, of course. It's pretty much every single convoy battle that we can name in the Mediterranean, they are part of. When we want to think about the Battle of Matapan, okay, we often think about the importance of the Swordfish and Albacore torpedo bombs going in and hitting the Vittorio Veneto. What we often forget is the fact that, as they're going in, the Vittorio Veneto is being strafed by Fulmars. Coming in, providing suppressing fire to try and make sure the Vittorio Veneto cannot concentrate its fire on the torpedo bombers. This, is what sh this shows you what happens when you're dealing with a full strike package. The importance of these aircraft in breaking up strike packages. Because if you can break up an enemy strike package, they can't do that to you. They can't have strafing fighters keeping your air defenses busy while your torpedo bombers make their runs. 
if the fighters are broken up off in, in their own sections, the torpedo bombers are all in singles wandering around. They can't do that. Well, that's what the British do to the Italians at the Battle of Manapan. They also take part in operations on the Eastern Front. Arctic convoys, of course, but also Operation EF, which was the attempt to raid Kirkenes and Petsamo, conducted in, in July 1941. And... As said, they were in the theatre. They were dealing, trying to defend Ceylon. They were trying to defend other things against the Japanese attack in 1942 because they were what was available. You had full marts. And the option was send nothing or send a full mart. It's better to send a full mart. Yes, it won't do as well as it should do. As well as you would like to do. Because it was the interim aircraft ordered in 1938 to come into service end of 1939 and to provide two years of cover until the Firefly was available and in conjunction with a single-seat fighter which was supposed to come in at the same time. The single-seat fighter never came into service. The Gullwing Sea a Spitfire, or Sea Fire as it was being called by Supermarine, and the other aircraft which were probably being developed to a similar program never appeared. They're stopped so that the Air Ministry can get all the companies to concentrate on fighters for the Battle of Britain. So that never comes into service. And the interim aircraft, well, the Firefly gets delayed because, again, various things want everything to be concentrated on. A similar story as the Ferry Barracuda. Everything is being concentrated on the aircraft in service, making them as viable as possible, that the developing aircraft get paused. It's kind of like the Royal Navy gets its carriers and capital ships paused at the beginning of war by the lovely Winston Churchill when he's promoted, he's made First Lord of the Admiralty. Because he's going in and he's applying the World War One doctrine. Pause! Capital ship and carrier construction and do immediate construction of escorts, which is why he often builds in his books and his talks. The escorts construction was an emergency construction. But again, if you watch this channel, you'll realise and know that, well, the hunt class escort destroyers, the flower class corvettes had all been ordered and were well under production well before war began. You didn't need to do the emergency action. Admiral Henderson, who'd been third sea lord, and even Lord Chatfield, who was the first sea lord for much of the time and period leading up to it, had actually been persuaded of the importance. Third sea lord Henderson had pushed for it and had got the escorts being ordered already at this point. The designs had been done in 1938, that the orders were placed in 1939, well before war began. They didn't need it, but Churchill went in and was sure he was right. His surety is useful at certain points during the war. He certainly has a necessary confidence without which Britain would have been in trouble, especially when we look at the viable other options. And I've discussed this on several other vi on other videos, but it's always worthwhile considering what the viable other options were. You basically have to have someone, in order to work out the British system, they had to be someone from the Conservative Party, because they were the majority party in Parliament at the time, it had to be someone who wasn't going to be called up to fight on the front, so that rules out roughly a hundred of the members of Parliament as being too young or are going to go off and fight the war. Roughly a hundred are frankly senile, and of the hundred left, how many have enough national platform, enough of a national identity that the public know them and are going to get behind them? It shrinks it down, and then you have to have the confidence to actually lead, and of course... In that scenario, Halifax says he's happy to serve under Churchill. Churchill keeps quiet and holds his cool. That's how he wins that one and be, it takes over from Chamberlain. But there are some seriously bad decisions taken for the Royal Navy at the beginning of World War II based on the idea that A, they were only fighting the Germans, and B, the war was going to take place in Northern Europe only, and not go had to take place in the Mediterranean, not be in the Far East, and not require the Royal Navy to spread out around the world. And the trouble is, you take that decision, you stop things for a short amount of time, and then you restart them. It takes months to restart momentum once you've stopped momentum. It takes years to get back to where you were. This is what covers it in that time. And I think it does a very good job. I think its service is complex enough and valuable enough. It does a very good job. It's six full Mars. 
which are helping from HMS Victorious in tracking the Bismarck. Not just swordfish, there are fulmars involved as well. And that's an advantage. Why is that an advantage? Because it means you can pull your swordfish back to form them all up for a strike. And that's what you want to do. Far from it being a disadvantage, oh, it's also a reconnaissance aircraft, it's an advantage. Especially for the Royal Navy, which under treaty decisions had had to make a choice. Survivability of carriers, which could be operating on the other side of the world from our industrial base, which can repair them, i.e. the Far East, if the potential war of Japan. And again, uh, if you look up videos on this channel, there are things about Tsingtao. And the fact in January 1939, the Royal Navy's pointing guns at the Japanese. And the Japanese are pointing guns back at them. That's a real conflict the Royal Navy's got to consider when it's designing its carriers. And under treaty limitations, it's allowed a maximum displacement. And that's affected its designs. Especially the maximum cumulative displacement. So Ark Royal and the first three of the Luchess class are ordered and designed under the overbearance of the Royal Navy having a maximum of 135,000 tons to get all the aircraft carriers they need. Let's put that in realistic qualities. They had a cumulative tonnage allowance which was less than the Royal Navy's two current aircraft carriers displace. Less. They were allowed a cumulative total tonnage of all their aircraft carriers, which would have been less than what our two current aircraft carriers, the HMS Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales, displace. That's in 2024. If you're watching this video in 2054, I don't know what aircraft carriers the Royal Navy has, if they have them. I hope they still do. I think they're quite cool ships. But... Hello. Uh, the reality is, therefore, they had had to make a choice between air group size or ship survivability. And the ability to provide that air group might, might be a smaller air group, but be able to still operate that air group on D2, D3, D4, D5. And how quickly they could repair that ship. In what kind of facilities? Because if you design a ship to minimise the damage it takes, it's going to be easier and quicker to repair in forward positions. Because again, for Britain, a war in the Far East means the ship has to sail all the way back to the UK to get major repairs, and then sail all the way back in to be used. Let's be honest, the Americans, when they're looking at their fleet, are talking about crossing the Pacific, which is a fairly long distance. However, Compared to going down round Singapore, across the Indian Ocean, up through the Suez Canal, along the Mediterranean, and back to the UK as the shortest route you can viably do, with British infrastructure along to support it if it needs it help. And the Fulmar... Well, she is a product of all this. This aircraft is a product of all of that. This product aircraft is a product of the Royal Navy looking at the skewer and going, yay, we've got an accurate dive bomb. One of the most accurate dive bombers ever built. If you look at their bombing record, they are very, very good at hitting their targets. It was even, as said, it managed to, uh, thanks to Bill Lucy, did manage to knock up some kills, and a few others got some kills as well. But, it's not really a fighter. So, they're looking for a strike reconnaissance fighter. And they need an interim one. Because they've planned on the Firefly, but the Firefly is not going to come anytime soon. It requires development time. It requires work. So, what aircraft are around that can sort of fit the role? Well, this thing by Fairy can. Fairy put it forward. Fairy go, look, we build other things for you. We've got this. We think it works. A couple of tweaks, a couple of modifications, they go with it. And it was ordered in peacetime. It was supposed to be in service. It was hoped peacetime. They were hoping war wouldn't come that soon. And it not only stayed in service... A year longer than it was really supposed to in frontline service. 
L second L close to frontline service. It stayed in a year longer of service in than it was actually supposed to actually be in service. So it's actually 1940 and 1941. So it's to be covered for two years which were hoped to be peaceful, or at least deterrent focused, rather than actual war fighting. Conflict management, not conflict. And then when it does get in the service, and when it does find itself in a war, it does a good job. We talk about the damage Illustrious receives. We talk about the damage Formidable gets from Crete and all these operations. We forget about the sheer quantity of operations those ships did and they didn't get damaged. We forget about the sheer number of battles of operations of the Mediterranean fleet which took place where every single strike that came in, it didn't manage, matter whether it was 10 aircraft, 100 aircraft, 300 aircraft, were broken up by these. They broke up those strikes. They made them down into manageable chunks. And then the heavy AA mounted and chunked them up a bit more. Until they were in bite-sized pieces. And at that point, the medium AA, the light AA, engages the individual aircraft. And that works. It's not pretty. It's not 100%. There are going to be leakers. There are going to be enemy to get lucky and get a hit through. You're going to lose aircraft. You're going to lose ships. But it's war. If you think it's always going to be 100% perfect. And you're never going to lose anything. Then you're fighting ga computer games on easy mode. And judging the real world by it. The Fulmar is not a great aircraft. But it did a great job. It's not a gorgeous aircraft. But it kept its pilots alive and flying and fighting. It's not an aircraft you're going to sing songs of praise about. You're really not. But it's loyalty, it's quiet capability, they are going to inspire songs. 809 Squadron had a song for the Fulmar called Any Old Iron. Any Old Iron, Any Old Iron, Any, Any, Any Old Iron. Talk about a treat, chasing around the fleet, Any Old Eye Tie or Hun You Meet. Weighs six ton, no rear gun, damn all to rely on. You know what you can do with your Fulmar 2? Old Iron. Hold on. Now, honestly, that can be taken one of two ways. That could be taken as being almost derisive of it. But I don't. You see, the reason I don't take it as being derisive about it is because if you really don't like something in the Royal Navy, you would never compose a song about it. Nothing would ever come up about it. Even in Murph. It would just be hated. But this aircraft, it was a quiet competence. And it did its job. It did take out Axis dive bombers. It took out Axis fighters. But the whole point of it wasn't to go and kill them. Yes, there are aces made flying this aircraft. But its purpose is not to go and kill fighters. If it does, or kill enemy aircraft. If it does, that's great. Its purpose is to break up the enemy strikes. And the fact that it does that is what's required and what's good. And again, fighter direction comes involved. And fighter direction is critical. And fighter direction is in many ways as the Royal Navy develops, it goes from being a theoretical doctrine which they've been working on and experimenting with and testing for 20 years into an actual practical utility with this aircraft. They go from having carriers which were being planned, designed and built 
before they even had the concept, realistically, of what fighter direction was going to require to modifying those same ships and building the next generations with actual fighter director rooms. Actual control rooms. The forerunners of the modern operations and information centers you have on aircraft carriers and other ships these days that run fleet operations. And that's all being developed. As the war goes on, they're learning what works, they're not learning what doesn't. They're trying stuff, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it fails. The trouble is, when it fails, it fails spectacularly. And when it works, well, of course it was supposed to work. That's what you're there for. There has been much, when it comes to the Fulmar, damning with faint praise. I would say the biggest trouble for the Fulmar is that many of the people who have evaluated it haven't really looked at the doctrine and the reality of what it was required to do. And they tend to forget the whole fact that it was an interim aircraft and it wasn't being improved. It's not turned into the Firefly. The Firefly is a completely different development strand. It's not turned into this or that. I remember once having a discussion with historians and well, the, the Fulmar was so bad they had to rebrand it as the Firefly in order to keep using it. No, the Firefly is a completely different wing and uh, wing design, let alone internal airframe structure design. What are you on about? Well, they they look the same. That doesn't make them the same. Pencil can look like a pen. It doesn't mean on the inside the pen has lead. Anyway. So, I finish these videos with a question, usually. And that question is not so much homework, as one person recently commented, they they, they sent me a whole a whole um, long message on Discord with "I've done my homework," and I was going, "It's not what the questions are about. They're hopefully to help you go and give you a chance to think further about what was discussed in the video." The question is this. The Fulmar is, of course, not really different from the Swordfish in many regards, in that they are good, solid aircraft that do what, do what is required of them. The difference is the Swordfish has some standout missions which t turn into a hero aircraft. The Fulmar doesn't. So I'd like you to think, through the descriptions of aircraft and, your st and whatever wider reading you've done and think about how the aircraft are actually just okay at their job. They do it well enough. They're good, not great. And yet, ha don't have that reputation because they never have the hero mission. They never have the mission which allows them to stand out. So compared to others, they always suffer in comparison psychologically because of the people reviewing it. I'd like to hear your opinions. Anyway, what have we got coming up? Next week we have 824 Squadron coming on the 19th of March. A wonderful day. And, well, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Please do like, share, and subscribe if you haven't, because as I've said in some of my videos, I, there is a comp there is a bet between my mother and aunt over a spa day, which my aunt will treat my mom to if I get the fifteen thousand subscribers by Christmas. I'd also, like to point out that check you're still subscribed if you're watching the videos, because YouTube seems to keep unsubscribing people, and then I get messages going. Did you kick me or something? Because I've been unsubscribed from your channel. I'm going, I definitely don't do that, and I haven't, don't have the ability to do that. I think YouTube just sometimes maybe thinks people are fake accounts or something, because they don't comment or interact or something like that. I don't know what they do, but they seem to knock people off from subscribing at some point. So just check you're still subscribed, because 
about three quarters of my viewership or the people who view my channel or videos aren't subscribed. And yet they apparently, according to the stats, watch multiple videos. Which confuses me. I don't know. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you found it interesting. And take care.